Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 25th anniversary of the National Awards Dinner, presented by the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. May I please call your attention to the front of the ballroom. When you think about how uh, often people with psychiatric illness have been the lowest priority on the rung, uh, you realize that people concerned about this want them to do something about it once and for all. We started with an argument as to whether, since we had $50,000 in hand, we should fund anything because what if we couldn't get another $50,000? And to think that we went from there to spend to raising $300 million is no small uh, order of accomplishment. The first meeting of, uh, that I went to as a board member was when they we decided to give grants. At that meeting, they only felt that we could give two grants. And, and I said, two grants are not enough. We have to give at least 10. So they said, well, we don't have the money. I said, well, we'll get out and raise it. I can remember the day that letter came that I'd gotten this grant. It was the first grant I'd ever written, first grant I'd ever gotten. Northside has been the seat of so much of the scientific discovery that has resulted in the treatments that have made it possible for me to have a productive life. Today and every day, there are about 12 people in America who are getting their lives back from depression with the technology. I enjoy it when people get better and with this new technology, that happens. But to have that understanding, that insight, and some of that may have been the cognitive behavioral therapy, and some of it was also the clozapine. Uh, some of that may have been the running. It's really, it's a combination of all the things. You can kind of come up with a regimen that made sense and really has gotten his life back. Do you think that if you admit that you suffer from mental illness, people are going to point their fingers and jeer? But in my experience, what happens mostly is that people say, oh, I've suffered with that, or I've been so worried about my sister, or um, uh, you know, my kids don't seem to be doing that well right now. What do you know about this? To other families who have uh, someone with mental illness, there is nothing to be ashamed of. Um, it's nothing that should tear you apart. It's something that should actually bring you together. I think the future of research for mental illness is open, that the possibilities are endless right now. The discoveries have put us in a position to really leverage what we know in absolutely infinite numbers of ways. The hope for the future is really that we find better treatments and perhaps even find a cure and, uh, and also develop more productive lives and happy lives. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, Mr. Stephen Lieber. Thank you. And it's you know, a very exciting evening to be here with you all and to see what we have just seen, which is such an important segment of everything we do. I would like to take this occasion to further introduce the extraordinary achievements of the Foundation 
in the leadership it has had from Dr. Herbert Pardis. The organization's history of passionate commitment to its mission is the driving force for the fulfillment of hopes. As many present know, and others do not, I'll mention that the organization started in 1981, before the 25th anniversary here, when two gentlemen in Louisville, Kentucky, who were next door neighbors, stopped at their common fence to talk about their children. One of them had two sons suffering from schizophrenia. He told his neighbor that something had to be done to improve their lives, that it could not go on without hope. He asked his neighbor, Mr. Philip Audrey, who had been president of the American Heart Association, to give him some guidance. Mr. Audrey and the father, Mr. Bosworth Todd, decided to form the Schizophrenia Research Foundation. After they began to work on developing it, they saw the limitations of building a small local charity. So with Mr. Audrey's connections, they sought help in Washington. Mr. Audrey reached out to Mrs. Catherine Graham, the renowned editor of the Washington Post. She, in turn, sought consultation and guidance from Dr. Herbert Pardis, who was then director of the National Institute of Mental Health. Together, they agreed to form a meeting to bring together people interested in and with the potential for altering the future of the field. So Mrs. Graham hosted the meeting where Dr. Pardis brought together a small group of leading brain and behavior scientists and a representative of mental health support organizations. Together, they conceived with the National Alliance for Research on Schizophrenia and Depression, the acronym for which became NARSAD. Basic principles were established, namely that the best chance for expanding and accelerating research was to provide research grants to young scientists with fresh ideas and outstanding abilities. Dr. Pardis formed the Scientific Council, which then had 24 members. They were all volunteers. They were all outstanding leaders in the field, and several of them remain on our Scientific Council today. Supported by patients, families, and friends, in its first year, the organization provided, as you heard in the video, 10 grants to young investigators. Over the years, it added grants to a group called Distinguished Investigators with the intention of bringing people with outstanding achievement in the field and great ideas to bring the, a new vision. And then they also added Independent Investigators, the level between the two. The consequences today, 25 years later, is that the total of grant awards is over 4,000 research grants. The breadth is 31 countries have received support of NARSAD grants from this foundation. And the monies have gone to 425 universities and medical research centers. The donor support has been vital. And the total to date is 50,180 donors. And with multiple gifts from the donors, we have had 179,000 gifts, totaling $361 million. Our grantees are leaders in the science, as we will hear in tonight's awards, and many heard in the talks during the day today. Now, after 25 years, we're engaged in a new expansion, an expansion truly of hope and opportunity. With a major bequest from the late Mr. Oliver Colvin, Jr., and an expansion of our staff, including our first medical director, Dr. Jeffrey Borenstein, we are moving ahead at an expanding pace. <laughs> 
and Dr. Pardis continues to ensure that the analysis of and selection of outstanding investigators for support reflects the leading edge of the science. He has built the Scientific Council up from its original 24 members who covered the then known breadth of appropriate neuroscience and psychiatric research to its present membership of 138 scientists who provide us with insight and judgment in every relevant phase of brain and behavior science. This is an unprecedented breadth of expertise. It is also an unprecedented evidence of dedication, as each of these members is a volunteer. Cumulatively, they have reviewed over 92,000 research grant applications. All volunteers. All of us who've had the opportunity to contribute and work in support for brain and behavior, and NARSA and effort, have the deepest gratitude to Dr. Pardis and the other members of the Scientific Council, and of course to the outstanding scientists whose achievements we honor as we are honoring them tonight. They have helped to transform the life opportunities for so many impacted by the disabilities of mental illness, and it is still well underway. So I thank you, Dr. Pardis, and now it's your turn. Please welcome the President of the Scientific Council of the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, Dr. Herbert Pardis. Thank you very much, uh, Steve, and it's great to see you all here this evening. This is always a wonderful uh, couple of days, uh, and uh, the room is beautiful, and what we've got to say is beautiful as well. But I want to um, disabuse you of any um, notions uh, because Steve was a wonderful person that also occasionally puts in a little bit of hyperbole. <clears throat> first of all, if you notice the first meeting, you saw that when it was considered that we might make two awards, Connie Lieber established the first principle of what was then NARSAT and now is the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. And that principle is simply, it ain't enough. <laughs> and I want to tell you that you, I hope you all saw that um, David Stern resigned as the head of the NBA today. And we got a call uh, just a few hours ago to find out if Connie is available. <laughs> Now, I, I, uh, I couldn't say enough about Connie, but this is a team. This is a spectacular team. This is one of the smartest men you ever saw, married to one of the smartest women you ever saw. And Steve's comment that um, we've reviewed some 92,000 grant applications uh, I uh, had the um, CBO price this. Uh, it's a congressional, uh, what is it, congressional budget office or so? Uh, and they told me that if we had had the government do this, the deficit would have been doubled by now. <laughs> uh, but Steve is right in saying that we owe a tremendous vote of thanks to an extraordinary group of people who populate our scientific council. Uh, they are the best. Uh, the degree of experience, knowledge, position, we could go on at great length, is astounding. Uh, and they never fail to respond. And as a result, that takes a load of expense off uh, the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. And our intent is to get as much money directly into research as possible. And that principle is accompanied by the notion that uh, since uh, several of our donors were thoughtful enough to take care of the administrative costs, that if anybody tonight decides to give, give an extra dollar, or a million, <laughs> that all of that money will go to research, nothing else. And that's a nice principle to have. That's the way this foundation works. And I'll just say a couple of other things about the broad principles of the foundation. First, we are interested only in people who do outstanding research. We don't care what discipline they have. 
We don't care where they live. We fund programs from all over the world. We fund people, whether it's biologists, pharmacologists, uh, psychiatrists, uh, you name it. We funded a couple of cat school waiters who are doing some very interesting work. Um, we're interested in the work and not worried terribly much about the principle. Now tonight, uh, I have the pleasure to um, introduce you uh, to some one marvelous people who we want to commend. And there's several different kinds of work that uh, we uh, take notice of in this regard. Uh, and one of the kinds of work is not necessarily directly scientific or laboratory research. Because what we also commend is the number of people who deserve what we call the Productive Lives Award. And this award acknowledges challenges, hope, the capacity for individuals to live productive lives, not only with the help of science, but also with the help of friends, family, efforts of responsible medical community and corporate services. And so to introduce that, I'd like to show you a short video, and then we'll talk a little bit about more about our first award winner. The Lieber Recovery Clinic is part of the Columbia University Department of Psychiatry Day Treatment Program, and it's a clinic that serves people who have psychotic disorders, maybe comorbid conditions like Asperger's disorder or autism. And we offer people cognitive remediation, which is a, a service to actually help people improve their attention and memory and problem-solving skills. And uh, that takes place uh, partially on the com using computer-based exercises and partially with verbally-based groups. Most of the people that come here are uh, taking medications and they find that medications help them with a lot of their symptoms, but only up to a point if you really encourage people to take control over their lives and to, to learn to manage their illness, and you give them the skills and the supports that they may need to do that, that they'll be successful, even with these very tough illnesses like schizophrenia. Dr. Medaglia's leadership in the field of psychiatric rehabilitation, which focuses on the treatment of neuropsychological disorders, has been recognized and praised worldwide by her peers, and perhaps most importantly, praised by the families and individuals who've directly benefited from her compassionate approach. Her emphasis on cognitive remediation the ability to help people regain control over their brain and mental functions, reinforces the humanity and dignity for families and individuals managing mental illness. It has brought great hope and recovery to many, many lives. Please welcome Dr. Medaglia as she joins me at the podium. Well, it is a tremendous pleasure and an honor to receive the Productive Lives Award and to share this award with Judge Leifman, whose work I admire greatly. The Productive Lives Award recognizes that as important as supporting science as it proceeds to untangle the mystery of illness and to develop better treatments and a cure, it's also important to support and attend to the, to the very, uh, very serious challenge of living a full productive life while you're living with mental illness. So no illness is ever welcome, but mental illness is arguably one of the most stigmatizing. If somebody says, I'm living with cancer, people react with sympathy. But if you say, I'm living with mental illness, people become very distant. Most 
most severe mental illnesses cause cognitive problems. They, they cause memory impairment, attention problems, emotion perception problems. And imagine for a minute how difficult it is to socialize if you can't pay attention to what someone's saying or if you can't read their face and tell if they're happy or frightened. And imagine how hard it is to finish school if you can't remember new information. Yet with treatment that trains cognitive skills, our patients pick themselves up and they keep trying and they get results. They go back to work, they go to their classes, they finish school and they make friends. The other day, a mother of a 17-year-old newly diagnosed with schizophrenia asked me, what can I expect? What, kind of, what will his life be like? And I get asked that question quite a bit. And sometimes a productive life is a, is a life that's manifest in accomplishments that many people recognize. But sometimes a productive life is quietly productive. Both are cause for celebration. One patient said, I was sitting watching basketball with a friend and I had this moment when I realized that maybe I would be okay, that I'd have a life that I wanted to live and that despite my illness and all the things I've gone through, I could still be happy. So today I'm very honored to receive this award and I wanna thank the many people who have supported me. And let me start by recognizing Connie and Steve whose tireless work has completely changed the way mental health treatments are delivered. It's been such a pleasure to know and work with you. I also would like to thank my many colleagues and the students who inspire me constantly. I thank my family who are here, my husband Lawrence, my children, and Adeline Hirschfeld Medallia, who at 91 has mothered two BBRF awardees, <laughs> Bob Hirschfeld and now me. And last, I'd like to thank the many patients I have worked with for their courageousness and determination, which inspires me to keep working harder. Thank you. We're now pleased to present our second Productive Lives Award to the Honorable Stephen Leifman. Judge Leifman, we want to express our appreciation and admiration for your role as a passionate and tireless change agent. Blending expertise in the areas of criminal justice and mental health to transform Florida's mental health system your compassionate approach to addressing the wide breadth of concerns confronted by families and individuals within our judicial systems has resulted in great and positive impact on their lives and the general public. These contributions have served to increase public awareness and understanding of the often tortuous journey and impact felt by the millions of Americans living with a mental illness. Your emphasis on resiliency and the potential for recovery reinforces the humanity and dignity for the families and individuals managing mental illness, particularly during periods of crisis. Let's show the video we have, I believe, of Judge Leifman before we then ask him to join us at the podium. On any given day in this country, we have about 550,000 people in jail or prisons with serious mental illnesses, and another 900,000 on some type of community control. And so the court system and the criminal justice system has become the de facto mental health system in this nation. And it's a really horrible tragedy because we're not equipped. Uh, it leads to the double stigma of mental illness because not only do you now have mental illness, now you're a criminal with mental illness. And so the recovery paths become even more complicated and more difficult. Please help me welcome Judge Leifman to the podium.
Good evening. First of all, it's uh, incredibly humbling uh, to receive such wonderful recognition and such amazing company, with Dr. Medelia and the others that are here this evening. Uh, I also want to thank my wonderful family and friends that are here with me tonight, my mom, my brother, my brother-in-law, and my dear friends that uh, came up to share this incredible honor. I also want to thank the foundation um, for recognizing me tonight, but really more importantly, for recognizing what a huge problem we have with the criminalization of mental illness. When I became a judge, I had no idea I was actually becoming the gatekeeper to the largest psychiatric facility in the state of Florida. And while it sounds funny, it's sad because it's the Miami-Dade County Jail. My journey into the mental health world began one morning when I was ready, getting ready to go on the bench. And I was approached by the assistant public defender and the assistant state attorney. And they asked me if I would speak to a couple whose son was in jail on a case I was about to hear. This lovely, very sophisticated couple came into my chambers. They were literally shaking. The mom was crying. And they started to beg me to get their son help. They told me their son had gone to Harvard. He had a late onset of schizophrenia. He was now a homeless man recycling through the criminal justice system. And they just didn't know what to do anymore. As a judge, you think you have a lot more wisdom and power than you do. And because I was never trained in this arena, I made the mistake of promising them that I would get their son help. As I got up to go into the bench, the mom stopped me and she said, Judge, I need to tell you a couple more things about my son. He's brilliant, he can be very manipulative, but he probably knows the system better than you do. Because you see, my son is the former head of psychiatry at Jackson Memorial Hospital in Miami-Dade County. I was pretty taken back. I went into the courtroom. I called his case and he stood. And we started to have this remarkable conversation. And if I wasn't looking at him, I was listening to this Harvard-educated doctor who was absolutely brilliant, insisting he had not committed the crime in which he was charged and there was nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with him. But looking at him, I was looking at a homeless man who probably hadn't bathed in three months, who really needed help. He was in on some ridiculous charge, believe it or not, like possession of a dairy cart, which many of our homeless people get picked up on. He was probably in longer than the maximum sentence you could even receive for such a charge. I didn't want to hold him in custody. And I said to him, look, uh, I, I just don't understand because he kept insisting he was well. I said, why would a Harvard-educated doctor be in jail recycling through our system if he didn't have a mental illness? And apparently whatever I said triggered a crisis. And all of a sudden he started shaking back and forth. He put his hands over his ears and he started screaming and pointing and wailing. And he started pointing to the back of the courtroom screaming. Your Honor, Your Honor, Your Honor, you have to have that couple removed, pointing to his parents. And he had this look on his face that I could only imagine someone must look like right before they think they're going to be killed. And he started screaming, you must remove them, you must remove them. And I said, well, aren't those your parents? No, 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 he screamed. My real parents died in the Holocaust, and these are imposters from the CIA, and they came to kill me. I did the only thing I had been taught to do, which was to order an evaluation. The first one came back. It said he was incompetent in need of treatment. I ordered two more because I needed three to get him hospitalized. He was now in jail twice as long as he could possibly be on his charge. And I went, as I went to order him into hospitalization, the lawyers instructed me, because of his charge, I had no authority to involuntarily hospitalize him. By law, I was forced to release him, and I don't know if he's dead or alive today. We don't become judges to be part of that kind of problem. I left the bench relatively upset. I got on the phone, and I learned three very hard lessons that day. 
The first was that we had a mental health crisis in my county. As it turns out, Miami has the largest percentage of people with mental illnesses of any urban area in the United States. It's almost three times the national average. 9.1% of my general population has a serious mental illness. Number two, this wasn't a local and state problem, but as it turned out, a national problem. In 1955, there were some 560,000 people with serious mental illnesses in this country in state hospitals, and about 5,000 people with illnesses in jail and prison. Today, there are less than 40,000 hospital beds in this country, and I don't suggest we go back. However, last year, 1.5 million people with serious mental illnesses were arrested. On any given day, we have 550,000 people with serious mental illnesses in jails and prisons, and another 900,000 on some type of community control. And the third lesson I learned was that our community mental health system is antiquated. It is horrifically fragmented in need of great, great reform. And aside from the human cost of this ridiculous system that we call a mental health system, the tax costs are outrageous. In my state, the fastest growing subpopulation in our prisons are people with mental illnesses. It's grown by over 170% over the last 10 years. We went from 8,000 prisoners with a serious mental illness to 18,000 this year. It is growing so fast that our state has been told they need to build 10 new prisons over the next 10 years just for people with serious mental illnesses. And most of them are on low-level offenses and will be out in two and a half years. The cost to build and operate those 10 prisons over 10 years is $4 billion. There is something wrong with a society that is willing to spend that kind of money to incarcerate people that are ill rather than treat them. The good news is, because of the wonderful people I work with, my colleagues, the American Psychiatric Foundation, the Council of State Government, and the Policy Research Associates, we have learned how to educate our law enforcement. We have learned how to educate our judiciary. We have learned how to educate our lawyers to stop the madness. And we are lowering recidivism. We are reducing our cost. But the real hope, to me, lies with many of you in this room. As you unlock the mystery of the brain, we can only hope and pray that one day you will truly find a cure for these horrible, cruel, and debilitating illnesses. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to tell Judge Leifman, and I hope I'm speaking for everybody, I couldn't imagine a more eloquent statement of the devastating problem we have in mental illness in this country, as you just heard tonight. That was marvelous. <laughs> and you know, it, one other thing that comes, there's many things you can draw uh, conclusions about with regard to his remarks. One of which is I believe a lot of people who are reluctant to surface and help support efforts in mental health research uh, don't want to be associated because there may be a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons may be they think they're never going to be vulnerable to such an illness. But that's quite a story to hear the head of a Jackson Hospital psychiatric department one day become a homeless psychiatric patient terribly disturbed the next. Point is, we're all invulnerable. So thank you, Judge Leifman. One of my great pleasures as president of the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation Scientific Council is to present the annual prizes for outstanding research achievements. And we award these uh, prizes in several different areas. Schizophrenia, mood disorders, childhood and adolescent psychiatric research, and cognitive neuroscience. Uh, cognitive neuroscience being the study of all the wondrous workings of the brain in thought, behavior, and emotion. The scientists receiving these, re these prizes have conducted outstanding research throughout their careers. They contributed greatly to our understanding and treatment of mental illness. Tonight, we will introduce you to our outstanding achievement prize winners through video. So please, again, direct your attention to a film as we acquaint ourselves with our first group of prize winners. I'm in this game because I'm a psychiatrist and I want to help 
patients, but also I'm in it because of the intellectual challenge. When you meet for the first time people with schizophrenia, they express views, beliefs, ideas, attitudes that you really don't come across mainly in daily life. These are complicated disorders, other illnesses.